Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are talking about a little French novella called Carmilla. Now this came across my, I had never heard of it until recently and I found out about it because I saw ads for a movie adaptation for it on Twitter and I saw people sharing about it on Twitter and talking about how this story actually precedes Dracula. It's a vampire narrative that precedes Dracula. It's this French gothic story and it is it looked so creepy and scary in the advertisement that i was like oh i have got to watch or i well I'm, i am interested in watching the movie but i knew that i wanted to pick up the book as well and it happened to be so short that i just read the whole thing last night it's worth reading it's it'll probably take you a couple hours if you sit down and read it and i had a lot of fun with it and since i didn't it hasn't been that long since i read dracula for the first time and really really enjoyed it then i picked up frankenstein really really enjoyed that so i have been in the mood for these sort of creepy classic horror suspense scary stories and especially coming out of the Victorian area, being in the French Gothic kind of style, really, really enjoying it. And this story did not disappoint. But I have a lot to talk about, a lot to compare to Dracula with this. Obviously, Dracula was strongly, I think it's pretty clear, was strongly influenced by this story. And then a lot of things to talk about with this book, kind of just in general, because I found it so, so interesting. So let us jump right in. I think it's gonna be a long one because I have quite a few pages of notes. So this story, again, like the later Dracula, has a doctor and a man of science to sort of bolster and, uh, and affirm the narrative. In this case, Dr. Heselius it writes the preface to this narrative that's coming from a female voice, and it's sort of there to affirm the female authority. I think you see a lot of gender dynamics happening here. Not surprising given the time in which it was written. It, it's really interesting, I think, there's a couple of things happening. One is that I've noticed that Victorian literature, they often like to have a conceit or a justification for why the story is here or being written in the first place. And it's something that we see sort of like cropping up in literature in different time periods. But the Victorians, I see it over and over again. I talked about it with Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And I think there's a variety of other stories that sort of, that do that as well, where the narrative isn't, you know, it needs additional bolstering, it needs additional justification, it needs a conceit, it needs a reason for existing. And much like we have with Mina, we have this male authority sort of like complementing the rationality and the truthfulness of the female voice that's now going to come forward and present the story. As with Mina, you know, obviously she had her own personal experiences with the whole like Dracula situation, but she was also compiling the records of everybody else. So that was uh, an interesting aspect to that story that I think we see little hints of it here uh, as well. We have a little bit of England versus Europe, a little bit of the West versus the East, maybe. We have a, a really strong emphasis on the fact that this family is sort of from English background they're living in a foreign country they're living in an area of called styria which is apparently in southern austria there's also an emphasis on how frugally they're living they're not exorbitant they bought their the estate that they're living on it's uh, inexpensive compared to what you would buy of comparable size or value in england here we have you know th this sort of like a trope of the modern a haunted house. A lot of times you're starting off with a family driving up to the house and it's big and it's old and they're like, I can't believe we got such a magnificent house on such a deal. And you're like, it's because it's haunted. It's not a deal. And you know what's coming. And I feel like we have almost a little bit of that going on where it's like, we're in a dangerous area. There's vampires here. Like maybe not such a good deal that you thought it was. We know that it's near a now abandoned town and a chateau that belonged to the old sort of, uh, I think it was a count, a family of counts and countesses that lived there. But now the, the family has like died out and the, the town has died out. And I think we always find it creepy, like there's a certain uncanny feeling to abandoned buildings, especially if like nature has taken them back over and there's like overgrowth and stuff. Um, I have to think about that a little bit. We find that the main character, much, much later into the story, it's revealed that her name is Laura. For a long time, I thought she was Carmilla. 
no. Uh, it's important that they not tell her fairy tales so she's never been exposed to fairy tales or things like that because early in her childhood she has this very, very early vampire experience where she wakes up in the middle of the night, she's like six years old, and this woman appears in her bedroom and she has the experience where she, the woman comes in and sort of cradles her and she gets soothed. There's sort of like this mesmeric effect that vampires have and of course she's bit on the, you know, on her chest and screams out and has pain and blah, blah, blah. And, and everybody tries to convince her, oh, it was a dream, oh, it was this. But it's really important that it becomes part of the narrative that she isn't told folk tales, she isn't told scary bedtime stories, she isn't told fairy tales, because then you could track it up to her imagination. And so the author is sort of shoring up the possible explanations so that we are led, obviously, down this path of vampire her character is nervous. We see that she's always protected. Here we begin to see this predator and prey type language entering into the narrative. And I feel like the vampire narrative is always such a great vehicle for exploring sexuality as they do here. There's quite a bit of homoeroticism, homosexuality being explored here in a female-female uh, type of way, but you definitely have some homoeroticism going on where the vampire and, and we conflate you know our desire for food with our de with sexual desire all the time and so of course with the vampire and then with the piercing of the neck and all of this sort of like combined symbolism we're conflating those two desires quite literally in this character that it's a combined sexual desire and a combined combined with um, a desire for satisfaction for satiety it just becomes such a great vehicle for talking about these things we also have really strong paternal authority and a lack of female roles in mothers. We find out in the story that Laura, our main character, has been waiting for um, a visit from a young woman who's going, like she hasn't met her before, but her it's like her dad's friend has a young ward her, who, who is her age, and so he's gonna come visit her dad, and then it's like, oh, these young ladies can spend some time together, but her young friend or potential friend dies before they can get together. And we see that the uncle who is watching over this young girl then has this sort of like vehement rage and this strong response with this strong paternal authority that, that neither of these girls have mothers, neither of these girls have female role models, uh, and yet we see that sexuality snakes its way in from a young age into the domain of paternal authority. And again, also with this, we have this intersection of love imagery and death imagery very, very strongly, death language very strongly cir circulating around love. This is something that I've talked about a lot. And it comes up in Western literature all the time. It comes up in like, British, European, American literature all the time. It's a function of the romance narrative. I've talked about it ad nauseum, no need to go on. I'll link up other stuff over here. But it's just like such an important question that you know our culture is trying to wrestle through. And I think we're continuing to wrestle through it. So we see that when this paternal authority is violated, that the, the masculine sort of father figure wants to go on this campaign to sort of reestablish that authority, usually by killing off the mon monster. And I wanna kinda like push on this idea a little bit more because I think there's something even more going on here besides the grappling of female sexuality or sexuality in general and sensuality in general over and against patriarchal authority, if you will. So I think it's easy as modern readers to kind of look at it and, and interpret it that way and then call it done. But I do like just considering the counterposition just for interest and see what we can see how we can push on our assumptions. So on a deeper level, I wanted to sort of ask myself, well, why is sexuality sort of cast as being dangerous in the first place, something that young women needed to be protected against? And, you know, on one level, it's like, actually, there's, there's some real legitimate concerns there. One is that we see that love is emotionally dangerous. Even the ancients with their idea of Cupid, they saw that love is a force for chaos, that it was often destructive, especially when we're talking about erotic love, that it's destructive, it's, um, harmful, it hurts the people who fall in love, they hurt themselves, they hurt the people around them. Like we see it as this chaotic force in society. It's not necessarily a good thing for you to have Cupid pierce you with one of his arrows. 
It's also like quite literally dangerous, especially for women, because you have the pregnancy problem. Women were dying all of the time in childbirth. You, we didn't have birth control back in the 1860s, 1870s, very, very rudimentary ways of trying to control whether or not a woman got pregnant. And then of course, being a woman or having a young child puts you in a very vulnerable position, especially if the deci guy decides to ski daddle. It's like your humans like take a really, really long time to develop. They're highly, highly dependent on their parents and their caretakers for a really, really long time. Counteracting that is obviously the very strong biological drive to reproduce. And hence you have these ambivalent feelings that are warring with each other, right? And so you have the strong, strong biological desire to fall in love, to reproduce, to have children, fighting with these societal saying like, watch out, and also like experience, watch out. Like we are lucky that we live in such a time that your skin isn't gonna rot off of your bones because you have syphilis. We've dealt with a lot of these sexually transmitted diseases. If they're bacterial, it's like, we've got antibiotics, you're all good, like gonorrhea, no problem. Which is not to say that it's still not, you know, something you want to avoid getting diseases. Obviously they have side effects and the drugs have side effects and that sort of thing. But the, the level of risk is just so much lower today because of modern medicine, both for sexual activity and for the pregnancy question. So I think there's a little bit of an ivory tower kind of way in which we can, um, we can unintentionally fall into a trap of sitting on our ivory tower where we have the benefits of modern medicine to say like, oh, look at this patriarchal authority like coming in and just repressing women and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, actually there's like a balance there. What we see is that like social norms were providing the same sort of functional replacement that we've now gotten from modern medicine. And so social norms have allevi alleviated in our modern times, right? We don't need those sort of societal pressures to control this behavior because modern medicine has sort of filled in the gap for a lot of those threats to our livelihood and our well-being. So the result is that sort of symbolically speaking, you have order, tradition, power, protection embodied in the father figure. It's not intrinsically masculine, it's symbolically masculine, right? Obviously a mother could protect, a woman can protect, a woman can stand up for tradition, a woman can stand up for logic and order and reason and all of those things. It doesn't have to do with like the fact of what you are biologically, it's just the symbolic language that we have used for millennia to talk about these ideas, father time, mother earth. You know, these are just very, very old and ancient symbols. It doesn't really have anything to do with anyone's like real gender. It's just all symbolic. And then of course we have sensuality, chaos, fertility, all embodied in the female form. Now what's really, really interesting, I think, about the way in which, especially in this story, the vampire force works is that it feels like a mother, especially in that first encounter when she, Laura is six years old, it's this old woman who is old enough to be her mother who lays down in the bed with her, who comforts her and sort of coddles her. But then it's also taking on the role of a child because she literally bites her on her breast and suckles from the child. And so you have the crossing of boundaries of mother and child and also lover all in one sort of activity and one sort of act. And um, that's part of the way in which the sensual female violates the categorical logical male, if you will. Again, it's all symbolic. I'm not making any kind of claims about actual people in real life. It's just all symbolism. And the other thing that really struck me about this story is that it really feels like a Garden of Eden story just wrapped up in new clothes. So you have the old family house, you have the family seat, you have the farmers, you have the cultivated land, the sort of like Eden safe garden that's orderly. We have, they live on the fringes of a forest. So it's like, again, like this walled garden, there's this threat of chaos outside, this threat of collapse, even like socioeconomic collapse, because we have this society and family that has fallen and has been sort of imploded and been destroyed. You have this sort of snake that slithers in, even under the protection and guise of this paternal authority that comes in and speaks to Eve when she's by herself, you know, our main character. 
even ha our main character even has the same problems that Adam has. So we do have a little bit of like a role reversal here between Adam and Eve, sort of combined into one character, but she doesn't have a companion, right? So it's like very much like Adam going through the garden and naming all of the animals and being like, I don't have someone who's like me, who's my equal to be my partner. All of these animals have partners, but I don't have one. And we see that our main character, Laura, also has that problem. She doesn't have any friends. She's very isolated. She has no society. And in fact, this dynamic of her lack of society, I think is actually really, really important. This is actually why you give up your autonomy to abide by the traditional power structures is that you get the benefits of society. So if you wanna you know, have all of the autonomy in the world and do whatever you want, sexually, if you want to not wear underwear, if you want to not wear a mask and protect other people from your germs, this is still in the time of COVID, you know, like go be a monk or go be a, a recluse, a hermit, like out in the middle of the forest, no one cares what you do. Like you can wear or not wear whatever you want. But if you want to participate in society and have the benefits of society, which is culture, language, community, safety, but you have safety in numbers, you know, like if you want to be a hermit out on the savannah, like you're going to go get eaten by a lion. Like there's real threats out there. So there's real benefits to society, right? Um, and so as human beings, we're willing to give up some of our autonomy, some of our personal power in order to be able to participate in this social system. That's like how society works. And I, I guarantee it, like for any couple that's out there, the, the bedrock of the arguments that you have with your partner are going to be, you are living your life in a way that is inconvenient to me. I would like you to live your life in a way that is convenient to me because we don't want to give up our power. Like it's not something that we enjoy doing. We only do it, you know, under the pain of death because lions are out in the savanna. And like the, the threat of not participating in society has to be great enough for, for us to overcome our intrinsic selfishness because we're all selfish jerks. We're really, really bad at compromise. So even the father kind of recognizes this injustice because the main character is getting the short end of the stick. She's given up so much of her autonomy to be a participant member, a properly ordered citizen, participating in the traditional power structures and societal framework, but she doesn't give, get the society. She's by herself. She's supposed to get the benefits from it as well. And so he recognizes this injustice from the start. And this is kind of a big problem for the structure of the narrative as it exists. So the circumstances of then the girl coming and staying in their house. So what happens is basically they're out for a walk. She and her father are out for a walk. They've just found out that the young girl who is going to be her companion is not able to come because she died dramatically and suddenly and they're really sad about it. And this carriage comes like just blasting through the neighborhood, gets in a carriage accident and like topples over. And there it seems to be three generations of women, but at first you only see two. You see one, a woman who looks like a mother and a woman who looks like it's her daughter. And they kind of tumble out of the carriage. The daughter seems hurt. The mother is like kind of brushes herself off. They get themselves all up together. She's like, I am in a huge rush. I cannot be delayed. I don't know what to do about my daughter. Like she's obviously, I'm gonna have to take her with me. Like I don't have any choice. I know she's been, you know, obviously just gotten out, basically a car accident, a carriage accident. But you know, I, I'm under these, these tight deadlines. It's a secret, I can't tell you about it, blah, blah, blah. And so the father sort of recognizing that it's this very noble family, she has this very imposing presence, sort of says like, well, leave your, your young daughter with us. We'll take care of her. We'll make sure she gets the medical care that she needs and she can be a companion to my daughter. And when you come back in three months time, she's supposed to come, the mother figure is supposed to come back in three months time. Then you can pick your daughter up at that time and, and go about your lives. And this just seems like really inc incredible to me, like very difficult to read. Like I was reading it and I was like, mm. You know, and of course, like the story is purposefully building this suspense where it prolongs this like knowledge that you as the reader have where you're like, it's a vampire, she's eating her, you know, and the characters are like, I don't know, I just feel sort of tired sometimes and I keep having these nightmares. That, that's part of like the, like building the suspense of the novel. But this particularly seems just hard for me to, for me to like suspend my disbelief. I also really just enjoy the lack of subtlety in this writing. I talked about it with Dracula as well. It's like, 
you know, the pass we get a little passage of like, oh, did you see the other old woman who was in there who's like, ah, ha, 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 I'm evil, you know, like basically just has an evil written across her forehead. Oh, yeah, she seemed really weird. I don't know. And so just the servants look evil and gaunt and it's like, you know, just all these signs that, but again, it's like we as modern readers come to this story with so much context, so much familiarity with the Dracula narrative, with the vampire narrative that is, maybe it didn't seem as obvious to readers of the time. I don't know. We see that when they take the young woman in, she becomes a really good friend to our main character, Laura. Carmilla is her name. And uh, in her bedroom is a, the room that they provide Carmilla with is a painting of Cleopatra with the asp to her bosom, which is, a, you know, legendarily how Cleopatra committed suicide. Real subtle symbolism there, real subtle connection. We also see that Carmilla is an anagram for the name of Countess Mircalla, which is the count, the Count family that I mentioned lived in the chateau that's now crumbling in the forest. So it's like, oh, she's the same lady. <laughs> I think my favorite part is when, so Carmilla has been feeding now on Laura for a while. And finally, one night Laura actually like wakes up in the middle of one of Carmilla's like feedings on her and Carmilla is just like drenched in blood, like top to bottom. And um, Carmilla disappears in the middle of the night and they can't find her and they can't find her in the morning. And so my favorite part is like the father comes in and is like, let us rationally understand what's happened. So he's like, Carmilla, did you ever sleepwalk as a child? And Carmilla's like, yes, it's funny you mention it. I told, when I was a child, I totally did. I understand. Yes, me as the male authority figure, let me come in and tell you. But you know, it's like, it's definitely putting the burn on the male authority figures in this narrative because they're kind of incompetent to protect their daughters. They're incompetent to really understand what's going on. And so it doesn't really paint them in a positive light. <laughs> My father smiled and nodded. Mm, yes, it is as I thought. My confirmation bias is coming on strong here. It's really effective, like I said, it's suspense because it's so obvious to the reader, or at least the modern reader, uh, what's going on. But I will say that th there is a big difference between this novel or this novella and the Dracula novel, and not just in length, but also in structure. So the front part portion of this novel is very similar in what Dracula is trying to do, which is that we have these mysterious circumstances, these young women that are beset with these vampires. We're trying to figure out like, why is she getting sick? Why is she so tired and languid all of a sudden? You know, she suddenly, the, she had a bloom of beauty and now she's pale and wan. It's like, what's happening, you know? Uh, but Dracula pretty quickly, you know, well, I would say it spends a good amount of time in that mis mystery stage. This story wraps it up once we figure out, oh, it's this vampire, it's about one chapter, boom, we found out where her crypt is, let's kill her in her crypt, and then a little bit of explanation of like vampire lore. But the Dracula, in Dracula, like the adventure part of like tracking down Dracula, finding out where he lives, outsmarting him, trying to entrap him, getting back to Dracula Castle, going across Europe. Like there is a lot more on that like back half of the adventure part where you're kind of like dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. Like now we're uh, an action story instead of like a suspense horror story. And so really interesting how I guess Bram Stoker decided to extend that portion of the story out and make it much more actiony. But that's really the biggest difference is like that back chunk is like, instead of being a page and a half is like, and here's another 200 pages. No, here's another 80 pages more like, but yeah. So that is my analysis of Carmilla. I really, really enjoyed reading the story. It's super creepy. The um, homoerotic sort of tensions between these two characters are like, ooh, creepy and un unnerving and also like exciting, just like the character herself is going through. It's really, really, unusual that a story at this time was really even dealing with female-female attraction. And I think its connections to the Eden story, to male authority, female sexuality are really worth, worth exploring. So I hope you enjoyed my discussion today. So until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.